Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. Managing the budget of any city is very intimidating, but imagine managing Los Angeles's budget in terms of oversight. Well, my guest today does just that. I'm delighted to be joined by our city administrative officer, Richard Llewellyn. So nice to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm sorry, right off the bat, how intimidating is it managing or having, being responsible for the oversight of a budget for a city as large as Los Angeles? You know, it's, I'm very blessed that I have good staff. The city has good administrative staff around the city that help us, but it's intimidating. Certainly in rocky times like right now, it's yeah. particularly intimidating. Um, we have a $12 billion kind of downtown budget. And if you add the utility, water and power, the airport, the port, we're 25 to 30 billion. We're one of the biggest local governments in the world. And there are lots of pieces in that many departments yes. and sort of units. Actually, you bring up an interesting thought in my mind when you said that we're one of the biggest, you have one of the biggest departments in the world. So would we actually basically have the same budget of small countries? Oh, bigger than many small countries. Really? Yes. One of your primary responsibilities is oversight of the budget, and actually 2020 has posed this untenable scenario. How do you strategize even planning or reporting with everything honestly being a moving target, everything you cannot predict? It's not easy. Okay. Um, I think there are a couple of things that we try to do. One is we try to call it as we see it. I know that sounds corny, but honestly, that's what we do. And it's the best information for the policymakers to make the hard choices. Um, we are reporting more regularly than we're, our normal schedule is roughly four times a year we give budget updates. Mm -hmm. We're doing it every month um, to try to keep sort of on top of it. And honestly, it's changing every single month. We do consult, you know, experts around the country and the world. We're lucky we have UCLA and the Anderson School right here um, to ask what they're seeing. Um, what they're seeing about when we're going to get a handle on COVID, when our economy is going to reopen and start again, how fast it's going to start. But all of that, as you say, is certainly prediction. We do the best we can, but many people would say it's just guesstimating at best. So it's tough. Um, we can't, we don't want to say gloomier than it is because we don't want to cut important city services if we don't have to. It's not good for the city, it's not good for the residents, it's not good for the economy, um, where we're trying to jumpstart the economy. And yet, we have to be just as honest as we can. So it's what keeps me up at night every day. Are there parallels between Los Angeles and other cities across the country, or are our issues unique to us? Because we have a particular weather pattern that's not the same as different parts of the country. We have a particular demographic of diversity that is not necessarily the same. Or is a big city kind of a big city and the major issues are the major issues? Uh, yes and. Okay. Um, I think it's probably more similar than not. Certainly most big cities rely on things like their tourism industry. We happen to have a slightly bigger one, but New York has a big tourism industry. Chicago has a big tourism industry. That industry has been hit very, very hard. We all run airports. Airports have been hit very, very hard. Airlines have been hit very hard. So we have many of the same challenges. Um, we're all moving towards service economies. So that restaurant that's closed, you know, it's not a big business. It doesn't have hundreds of employees, but it has 15 who are all at home. Mm -hmm. um, we're all facing that around the country. So our, our sort of common shared interests are actually, in this responding to the pandemic, are very similar. We are lucky here in California, in general, and certainly in Los Angeles, that we do have a diversified economy. Mm -hmm. So the whole economy has not 100% shut down. You know, the tech sector is still going, working, but working from home. But the service economy, the tourism economy, they're having tough times. So are, you mentioned that there are these updates that you are sharing information. So is it, do you speak to other city administrative officers across the country? Yes, we talk regularly Constantly. and our staff talks regularly. There are sort of trade associations, really. Um, we also work through the various kind of Moody's, Standard & Poor's that kind of rate all of us right. on how our debt's doing and how our finances are doing. So we also hear from them. So we have many sources to try to get the best information we can.
Prior to the pandemic, actually, the, the city was in pretty good um, fiscal health. There was a reserve, et cetera. However, in September, you estimated a fiscal shortfall that could be as dramatic as $600 million. We're a little bit past September, not substantially, but a bit. Um, how are we moving and what are you feeling right now? So we haven't totally, I, I don't want to give any secrets. We right. haven't totally updated. We're not feeling any better. Um, the sort of around the country and around California, COVID is up again. Mm -hmm. You know, the single biggest thing to getting our revenues back is the economy reopening. And economists debate, is it going to charge out of the blocks or is it going to kind of limp out of the blocks or some combination? But it can't move at all until it's reopened, mm -hmm. until indoor dining is allowed, till you can just go in a restaurant and people feel safe going in a restaurant. So, you know, the last month hasn't produced good news for us. Um, we just need to get a handle on the pandemic. Then we need the economy to, to go. And you mentioned a little bit earlier about um, how our debt is being managed and how we're proceeding. So where are we with LA's credit rating? Are we doing okay in that regard? You know, we've, we've done remarkably well. Um, since the last fiscal crisis, which seems like a long time ago these days, we all remember the real estate burst of 10 years ago or so. We didn't have enough reserves. Um, many of the same elected officials, including the mayor, we're sitting around the table talking about how we're going to keep the lights on, and they haven't forgotten it. We built up our reserves. We have not built up our workforce as much as people would like to try to leave some room. Um, so in many ways, we were well positioned to deal with the calamity, but not one of this size. But our bond ratings are strong, which is our basic debt rating. We're basically double A everywhere, which is better than many jurisdictions. Uh, they've gone up since the last fiscal crisis. So I feel good about that. Um, I think we were in good shape. We did have decent reserves that are what is going to let us somehow figure out how to get through the pandemic as opposed to starting behind, going back to your point. If we were already behind, we would totally be flattened. As it is, we were kind of ahead. Now we're behind, but we have, we have maneuvering room. Really naive question, but you know, this is a learning experience for me as well. So you have oversight and you can actually look at the budget and see. So what do you offer the mayor and the city council in terms of uh, action items? Do you look at everything and you say, okay, this is where we stand, you guys make the decision, or this is where we stand, this is what I suggest? Um, some of both. Certainly um, the mayor and council are the policymakers elected by the residents to make the hard decisions. So some of it is obviously going to be from them, but we work closely with them and we do make recommendations like stop hiring, like close that program, like you have to look at layoffs. Um, our labor partners, we have to look at reducing compensation. So we do make those recommendations. We are currently, um, we worked with the mayor and council as right now on another cost reduction exercise. Um, which we will be making recommendations from later this year, um, which will not be fun because the pandemic hit just as the city was preparing its budget for this fiscal year. We're July to July. Right. So some of it was baked into this budget, which was a tough budget as a result, but the pandemic has been worse than we expected. So we're going to have to cut even more. It's, it's going to be a tough year. Worse or longer lasting, or a combination of both? You know, I think some economists are still predicting once we figure out the virus, the economy will roar back. And it will be this very deep trough, but that's sort of the, the V notion, and it'll race back to a place that's sustainable. Others are less confident about how quickly we're going to run out of the blocks once we sort of get a handle on the virus. Um, and that we may kind of putter out. If we putter out, it's going to be long and painful um, or longer. Um, but again, all economists agree until we have a handle on the virus, the economy can't truly take off. Well, and imagine, especially in an area, and you were talking about tourism, and you're talking about the airport, and you're talking about the port, so much of it is also going to be um, 
how the rest of the world is responding to Los Angeles because it's what we do internally, as you mentioned, restaurants and businesses, et cetera, but it's also how we're impacted by whether anybody can travel to the United States or whether anybody from the United States can travel and all of that keeps changing. No question. And I actually think that, you know, we, we, once we feel like California did better than many states when the sort of the going got tough in, with the virus in the summer. And so we were feeling good about it. And then we look around our own country, we look around the world, and the virus is taking off again. Mm -hmm. So England's in lockdown, parts of Europe are in lockdown, Asia's starting to lock down. Our sort of our big tourists aren't coming right now, as you say. Um, it's sort of, I hate to say it, it just keeps coming back to figuring out the virus and then sort of watering the economy to get it going again. How much do we need the federal assistance? Has it helped? And should we continue to look for more? I mean, where, where is that uh, piece of the puzzle fit into all of this? You know, I th certainly for Los Angeles, we could not do this without federal assistance. Just, that's just a fact. Um, and that is true of sort of local and state government around the country. Um, we are very fortunate in this country. Uh, we have the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, we've all heard of with the local fire or the local storm. <coughs> we think of it as being the two week occurrence, it's terrible, and they come in and then it's done. Well, of course, the pandemic's lasting, but uh, FEMA is a great partner. Um, they do pay essentially 75% of our cost to respond to the pandemic um, as a general matter. They do only pay at the end. So we have to find a way to pay those costs now and just bill them and hope they'll pay us soon, which is not soon. So we have to float finance it like without getting the receivable back, we're paying for it. Um, but that only covers our costs. So if we have to send an extra police person, an extra road person crew to deal with something, they help us pay our costs. One of the problems with this pandemic is our revenues have dropped precipitously. Our hotel tax, most of us pay hotel tax when we go somewhere else. We're used to seeing it on the bill. <coughs> We're not getting those. People aren't traveling. Our sales tax are down. Yes, people are buying on, online, but they're not going to the mall. They're not going to the restaurant. Um, so all of our revenue sources are down, and FEMA does not cover that. And that has got to be a Washington partnership with state and local governments. We need another stimulus bill. They have, I very much appreciate, we did have one, um, the Corona Relief Fund. It has been critical to our keeping our head above water so far, but we need another one. And whether you're sort of a, and certainly the mayor of Los Angeles, Mayor Garcetti, a good Democrat has been very active in the U.S. Conference of Mayors with his Republican brothers and sisters <coughs> that this isn't a Democrat or Republican issue. Mm -hmm. It's something that both sides need to get together and hammer out a deal. This may be completely out of uh, context and it might be inappropriate to even say, but I'm sure on the flip side of this, everybody's a little bit worried about, you're talking about floating all of this debt because of the lack of this, all these taxes that normally come in. I imagine that the average citizen is a little terrified that on the other side of this, that they are going to somehow carry the burden of responsibility in terms of taxes, you know, the state uh, taxes going up, local taxes going up, taxes going up everywhere possible, because this debt will have to get paid. You know, I agree with you. And I think, and I'm an ordinary person. I live in Los Angeles. Nobody likes to pay taxes. We like the services that taxes provide. Um, we're, we're taken care of in some ways in California, as you know, in that we basically, the people get to vote on new taxes, pretty much. So we won't be burdened with California taxes unless the residents decide to tax themselves. They, they believe that they want to invest in that program. You know, even Washington, you know, I'm a budget guy. I don't like deficits. I don't like borrowing. I don't like, you know, putting sort of our work on the credit card. Um, I'd rather pay as you go. On the other hand, um, and it's, if there's a time where sort of deficit sort of spending is a good idea, 
it's in times of economic crisis. And history has shown us that. Coming out of the Depression, coming out of World War II, sort of priming the economy, help the economy turn around, and help pay off some of that debt. So I agree it's not free. You know, borrowing money is not free. Money from Washington isn't free. Somebody's got to pay for it. I think right now it's cheaper to borrow it than to not do it. And some really interesting programs came out of those debt relief programs no in, the, in historically. I mean, you know, we have some nice parks and some good walls no and nice things about that. So um, one of the other, and you get to have all the fun subjects. <laughs> one of the other issues with Los Angeles, of course, uh, is trying to face the growing crisis of homelessness. And, you know, I know there were some pretty substantive programs in place, and I know some additional programs went into place uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So how are all those being managed fiscally right now, and how is that being balanced with the other needs that you are obviously aware of in the city? Well, you know, for many people don't realize, even though I'm the budget guy, I'm sort of like the chief financial officer of the city, we also are an office that's sort of cross-cutting. So we end up getting some issues that involve all the city or many departments. So my office is actually the home of the city's homeless coordinator and the homelessness response. Um, so I spend much of my time on that every day. I do think homelessness, many of our elected officials, I happen to agree with them, have said they see it as a humanitarian crisis of our time. I think we need to do something. Um, we're doing amazing things, we need to do more. Um, the residents tax themselves to build housing. The residents tax themselves to provide more services. Um, we have housed more people last year than ever in history, uh, but unfortunately more people are falling into homelessness every day. It's a tremendous challenge that is gonna require temporary housing, permanent housing, services, and sort of a societal commitment. But I see a lot of that happening. And as far as how can we pay for it, we can't, but we are. You know, the mayor and council have said this is a priority. We've got to figure out a way to do it. Um, the state has been helpful. The federal um, COVID relief money has been helpful because it's being helping with our homeless unhoused residents. Um, so I very much appreciate Sacramento on this one. I appreciate Washington. Um, we need to do more. But certainly the mayor and council have said, as terrible as our budget is, this is a priority. And they hear it from their residents as well. Should we maybe delineate um, the, because homelessness is a huge catch-all for a number of issues. I mean, there are those that are literally, uh, have lost the ability to pay for housing. There are those that have mental ill issues. There are those that have addiction issues. So how can you, from a, a, a large perspective, you can't treat it all the same. You have to actually understand the different reasons and the causes. So how is that being managed uh, in terms of fighting this growing problem? So I guess a couple of things. One way you can treat it all the same, um, and I think most experts agree, and certainly our mayor and council do, that it's easier to treat any of those problems if you get people inside. Oh, interesting. Once you have a roof over your head, and you're getting fed, and you're not living on the street, then I can help you figure out your addiction issues, your mental health issues. Um, most people are willing to move inside if they're given a place to move inside. You know, that's why sort of much, many in the sort of the homeless community call it housing first, because you can't really treat addiction if somebody's living under a freeway. You know, they need to be inside, going to their doctor, going to their therapist, taking their meds, um, all the kinds of things that, that we can do because we live inside. But if you're living under a freeway, how are you going to get to that clinic? How are you going to get to that social worker? How are you going to get to that benefits worker? So I think our goal is to get as many of those people inside, and then particularly working with the county, which runs social services, get them the services they need. Um, so that some people just need economic assistance, some people need a little hand up and they can move on. Other people really are, are broken, either mental health issues, particularly mental health issues, where they're gonna need help the rest of their lives. <coughs> One of the things 
the county has a great system of, they try to identify those people and get them on benefits. There are federal programs and state programs to help pay for their housing and their services. So it is very difficult. I don't want to minimize how hard it is, but getting those people inside, getting them into the service delivery system to treat their individual needs, and to triage. Don't give everybody the same. One thing you, I totally agree with, we can't treat everybody the same because that makes no sense. People have different issues, and people who only need a little help, why should we give a lot of help to? We don't have enough money to do that. People who need a lot of help are going to need a lot of help um, to stabilize and to stay housed. So we need to have a good system to assess people, to get them the right kinds of help, and to get them out of the system as quickly as possible. I wish you so much luck. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, you're kind of in an advisory capacity um, and kind of a working, but you also need to maintain an independent pla independence from both the city council and the mayor's office in order to do your job without any kind of um, questions. So how do you maintain that independence while still working so close with both of those governmental? So I'm actually technically the only city employee who works for both of them. So one of the ways I, I'm almost definitionally independent is the legislative branch looking at the executive branch and back and forth, I have to be able to serve both of them. Mm -hmm. um, I also think the way I serve the residents of Los Angeles, of which I am one, uh, is by just trying to call it as I see it. And that's ultimately serving both of them the best. I want them to succeed. You know, if council member, the new council member for downtown, Council Member De Leon has ideas. He's talked to his residents. He wants to do something. I want to help him. Mm -hmm. But I got to be honest. I'm sorry, sir, we don't have the money. Or <coughs> you're going to have to get consensus that that's the next thing that's going to happen because you have a whole list of things you want to do. And the way I help them is just by being honest and as accurate as I can be. So you have the power of no? Uh, well, my office is called the City Administrative Office, or CAO. It has had a reputation before being called the CA no. <laughs> yes. But I think that's unfair. We try to get to yes, but sometimes we're the CA no's. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> well, something you sort of said earlier kind of reminded me. Um, you said yes and. Um, and Walt Disney, it was infamous amongst all of his employees that if Walt wanted something, uh, you could never say no. You had to say yes if. So <laughs> I kind of see that you <laughs> run parallel there a little bit. You've obviously been in this position you were mentioning earlier about three years, um, but you've been in governmental offices for your career. So how did those positions prep you for this? Was it all foundational? Or are they somehow related? Do they somehow tie together? Um, because it's, it's an interesting realm that you live in right now. You know, I, um, my very first, I'm a lawyer by training. Um, my first jobs were purely legal, including I was at a private law firm downtown mm -hmm. that was former Mayor Reardon's law firm. Uh, and then I switched from working in the private sector to going into local government. And I went into local government because I love Washington, I love Sacramento, we need their money, but local government's where the rubber hits the road. And I've been fortunate to work both in the county and the city. I've worked for very decent people, some who were booted out by the voters, some who retired. Uh, there's nothing like working for somebody who's booted out not to get you to see somebody that you really respect and like and that somehow you didn't communicate your sort of good sort of wishes and values to the residents. Mm -hmm. um, so I think all of those jobs have helped me get ready for this job. Um, I've worked on the, in the city, I've worked in the city council and two different districts which was a sort of a middle income to lower income and upper income district, which showed two different things. I ran the city attorney's office for a while. There's nothing like running a group of a thousand people all telling you that the law says no, speaking of the no office. And, and then I worked for the mayor of Los Angeles. And that was a, on the mayor's executive team as we were coming out of the last recession. Um, but certainly one of the things 
from the last recession, I was in the city attorney's office in the room as the policymakers were trying to decide how to ever solve this budget crisis. We were the ones giving them legal advice on what they couldn't do, you know, lawyers. Um, but being there with them, trying to problem solve, was one of the best sort of things for this crisis right now. The pandemic's very different than a normal economic recession. Oh, of course. You couldn't plan for it. It just, it was a meteor that hit us. But being in the room where you, people who really want to save service for the best reason, because people do need the services we provide. People need their jobs. Laying off a bunch of people right now in this economy is not good for the economy, the people, mm -hmm. but it's also not good for the economy. Um, so I think that job in particular and being in the room while people were trying to figure out what to do with what hit them, the last recession was particularly helpful. Is there anything that the ordinary citizen of Los Angeles or just in general can do to um, affect this problem from a city standpoint? Should we all be, you know, making an effort to go out to dinner at least two, three times a week? Or should we, you, you know, know, I mean, what can we do? The first thing I was going to say, um, to the extent that you can financially support your local business. Um, and even if you feel uncomfortable going in businesses because of the health crisis, you can do carry out. It's safe enough. Um, get it delivered if you don't want to, you know. That is, that's the one thing, you know, the very first, I think, the second week, as we were all reeling from it, one of the things the mayor said was, everybody, I want everybody out there to commit at least once a week, you're going to get carry out from a local restaurant. Um, I do think that's the, the biggest thing we can do. The second and most important thing, um, that's what we do for the economy, but the biggest thing for the economy is the virus wear your masks, follow the rules, wear your masks, limit your contact. I know we're all sick of COVID. I'm sick of COVID. Um, we, all wanna, we all want it to be over. The way it's over is by following the health rules. That's how you're gonna get the economy going again, by getting control of the virus. And if people do wear their masks, would that also, because you're in the room, I mean, talk about Hamilton, I wanna be in the room. Um, if we all behave that way, then I would think that those that can open more businesses, meaning the mayor and the I governor and everything. No question. No question. If we if we residents follow the rules, that's the biggest primer we can do and pump for the economy. So when you're working with the mayor and you're telling him and the city council, et cetera, and you're telling them the, the lay of the land, um, what do you hear from them? in terms of what they're hoping for and what they're afraid of? You know, it's an interesting question. I think Los Angeles pre-pandemic was sort of in the, in the world zeitgeist. It was LA's moment. You know, we won the Olympics. That's a little thing, but it's a symbol of sort of- Something to look forward to, something to work on. You know, on. the food scene here totally. was- the entertainment scene. We always had, we always had, you mentioned Disney, we've always had production of entertainment, but the new art, the new music, the new food, tech, you know, people think of the Bay Area, we're the second largest tech city in the country. Um, Snapchat, uh, it was, so people were excited <coughs> and we faced this tremendous problem of the gap between the rich and poor that the hope was somehow we were going to start getting a handle on that. The pandemic came. So I think what I, what I mainly hear is people want to figure out the pandemic so they can get back to the work of separating the, doing something about the separation between rich and poor. Well, I hope next time we have a chance to chat, um, we can talk about uh, more lighthearted things, <laughs> but thank you for doing your job. I would be honored to <laughs> not be discussing homelessness or the budget. You got it. All right. Well, in any case, it still was really fun to talk to you. So thank you so much for everything. My you pleasure. Did. Thanks right. for having me. Thanks. And that's a wrap on this LA Currents.